Okay, we're over a uh, hundred people attending live, which is, is quite good for this session. So thank you all for attending. So uh, it's uh, 2.30, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I want to remind everyone that uh, the session will be recorded as there are a number of individuals who couldn't be present to the live session today. Um, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining the opening session of Safety Days 2022, uh, Safety Culture with PCL Construction. For those of you who don't know me, which is probably the majority of you, because I'm mostly involved in third year, uh, my name is Rob Peace. I'm a departmental assistant in mechanical engineering, and I'm also currently the co-chair of the Engineering Local Safety Committee. I graduated from the University of Saskatchewan from mechanical engineering, uh, and just a little blurb about the Local Safety Committee. It reviews and addresses health and safety concerns within the College of Engineering, promotes health and safety, provides recommendations on health and safety policies and procedure, and helps eliminate hazards through inspection and reporting. So I'm happy to be here to kick off Safety Days, and I want to thank PCL Construction for supporting this event, both as a sponsor and uh, participating by sharing their industry knowledge through guest speakers. And as we begin this week and another virtual safety days, many of us are joining from across the province, nation, or potentially even internationally. And I want to start off with our USASC land acknowledgement together. So as we virtually gather today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Tricia Gibney with PCL Construction. Uh, Tricia is a safety professional with over 15 years experience in safety and over 20 years experience in construction. She holds the designation of Applied Science Technologist and is a certified registered safety professional. She has risen to become PCL's Health, Safety and Environment Manager for the Saskatchewan, Saskatoon District and serves on the Saskatchewan Safety Council Board of Directors. So thank you, Trish, for joining us today. I'll hand it over to you for your presentation, which I greatly look forward to. My pleasure. Thank you, Rob. I'm happy to be here again this year. I was so excited to be asked to uh, come back again this year. I was given the opportunity to speak last year and really, really enjoyed it. So I'm happy to be here again. As I go through, if anybody has any questions, any comments, any, any hey, wait, I, I want to know more about that, don't save it for the end. Uh, feel free to shout that stuff out as you go. There is an opportunity at the end for some Q&A as well. So if you've got any burning questions, um, you can get it out there. I will also very, very happily share my email address and you can email me directly if you've got uh, want to know more about anything um, to do with construction safety, safety in general, safety culture, all the fun things that I'm going to start talking about. So a quick little bit about me, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. As Rob said, um, I have a di uh, diploma in uh, civil in civil engineering from SIAST at that time, it's SAS Poly now. Uh, and I also hold a uh, certificate in OHS from the University of Alberta, which I took through the U of S Extension Division. Um, I started out my adultish life as uh, an engineering technologist, um, did that for a number of years. Construction just makes my heart sing. So as I grew through, I also saw an opportunity for myself in a somewhat different role, still very involved with construction, but just a little different spin on things. So I moved into the safety world at about 15 years ago, a little more than that. Uh, I've been with PCL safety team since 2008, and almost a year ago, I moved into the manager's role for our Saskatoon district. So PCL, if uh, I'm sure you've all done lots of homework, but we have uh, our head office in Canadian operations is in Edmonton. Our head office for our US operations is in Denver, Colorado. And we also have recently opened a district office in Australia. Uh, so we are North America plus a little bit of a, a stretch across some, some of the ocean. Um, 
we now have offices in every province in Canada. We recently opened up an office in Quebec as well. That was the last place where we had to set our footprint up. So uh, we are a, a large construction company uh, and we often will say there is not anything that we don't do. Uh, we will do everything from a tiny little fit out in a retail fit out in a mall, all the way up to we've been heavily involved with Syncor uh, and Syncrude and, and a lot of the the oil sand stuff. Um, we are currently building uh, two or started one, potentially a second billion dollar hospital in Vancouver, uh, the Cancer Center in Calgary, some of our big projects in Saskatchewan. Uh, Mosaic Stadium is our flagship one that we all hang our hats on and are exceptionally proud of in Saskatchewan. Uh, on the USAS campus, E-Wing, we finished a couple of years ago. Uh, we also built the College of Agriculture, the College of Law. Um, so we do have a, a significant footprint in, in all of the major cities and uh, throughout Canada and throughout a number of the states. Um, so in my role, I help our operations teams and our trades plan and execute our projects so that we can work effectively and efficiently to deliver projects to our owners that we are all proud of. I have been asked to speak to you specifically today about safety culture, and I have sat a little bit on both sides of the fence from the, the person in the field doing the work through to the management side of things uh, and construction and engineering. So I'll offer you up a few perspectives that I've learned along my path. So oftentimes you will hear workplace culture referred to as the way we do things around here. Culture can be very, very tangible items like a safety share at the very beginning of a meeting or a CEO making job site visits while wearing all of the correct pieces of gear and not showing up in their Ray-Ban sunglasses and their patent leather shoes. Uh, it is also the intangible things like acknowledging companies, acknowledging indicators such as meeting all of their training opportunities and providing training to all of their people and doing safety inspections and learning from safety inspections and making sure that if there is an incident, corrective actions are implemented and they're followed up on. So I will probably see in your faces um, a whole pile of new folks. Many of you have oft, oft, odds are had jobs before. Um, anybody care to shout out or shoot into the chat uh, three basic rights as a worker in Saskatchewan? Right to know, right to participate, right to refuse. Christopher, well done. So we do, as every employee in Saskatchewan, have those rights. Um, any thoughts on some items that get reflected into a healthy workplace culture? Everybody's quiet on that one, so we'll, I'll do my best to help put some thoughts and some ideas into your heads. Any of you familiar with any safety regulations that work into engineering design? We're going to get into some more of that too. Um, situations where you just want to get it done. Let's just get in, get it done, look left, look right, carry on. Not ever, never ever. And then the last idea that I wanna plant in your head today too is um, agencies that publish standards that factor into safety considerations. So regulations, we have Saskatchewan OHS regulations. Any other agencies that publish standards that will factor into consideration? Uh, do I have any structural engineers, any aspiring structural? Mechanical? Anybody familiar with ANSI and ASME and CSA? 
National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. Those things of all, all of those standards, all of those ASCE, yeah, APEGs, not so much. They're not uh, a, a body that issues standards direct, but it, there are a number of others that will feed in. So we'll talk a little bit more about how all that fits into how you are going to grow. There we go. So as I said, culture is talked about the way that we do things here. I could spend days and days and days telling you about theories about what makes a workplace culture good or not so good. I could list out some very public incidents where the final investigation concluded a poor safety culture was the primary cause of the incident. Um, anybody recall an explosion on uh, an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico several years ago? That one at the end of the day, what they found was a blowout preventer had been missed. Digging back deeper and deeper, um, the final causation was that the culture, the safety culture in the workplace had been neglected and slid and they weren't following safety protocols, they weren't following procedures, and that's essentially what led to that giant explosion. So there, there are good cultures and there are not so good cultures. So I'm coming to you today and you are the designers, the dreamers, the visionaries of our very near future. So how do you, as new people in the workplace, fresh new minds in the industry, how do you actually influence and affect the culture in a workplace, especially the safety culture? Safety culture and overall workplace culture is about leaders. Plain, simple, period. It's about leaders, formal and informal. So the formal leaders that you see in your workplace are, are the managers. They are the, the people that uh, hold responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis for making sure the wheels keep turning. The informal leaders, those are the ones that you come very quickly to learn. They're the ones that actually create the personality of workplaces. And my hope for each of you is that in time, you will come to teach that personality to those that come after you. So things that get reflected in a workplace culture is, do people feel a sense of responsibility for each other? Do people share accountability when things go wrong or do they look to blame? Do they look to point fingers and, no, it wasn't me. Do people support each other for being cautious about safety or do they ridicule one another for not taking chances? And how do people act when things do not go as planned? You see here a lot about change management and how do we manage change? Do the known practices and procedures get brought into play when the, the plan changes or do the wheels somewhat fall off the motorhome and people in white respirators start rolling out? So, you're now looking at me and thinking to yourself, I'm an engineer, I'm not a safety person. And you're right. There's people that look after safety. Not totally wrong with that statement, but there is, as I said earlier, a number of pieces that will integrate into whatever field you choose, whether it be actual practice of of design or if you choose to go the route of becoming project manager or however you choose to follow your passion through the engineering field, uh, there are pieces that will infinitely weave into everything that you do. There are people whose profession is safety and that is, is what I get paid to do. I get paid to be a safety person per se. Uh, but we can teach you a whole new set of skills and make you ultimately a better professional and better rounded and wiser. And then you in turn can take all of that knowledge and make it the personality in your workplace. So as you go through life, make note of the items that you appreciate or work well for you. Make note of the things that raise the hair on the back of your neck. Remember these things and as you rise and grow. So let's talk a little bit about stepping away strictly from your chosen profession of engineering and building those extra components into making you a professional that is just a little bit better than the rest. While this doesn't necessarily speak specifically to safety culture, as I said earlier, there are some things that are going to make you stand out as a leader and you may be the formal leader of 
of a company or an organization, or you may be one of those informal leaders that influences. To be a safety leader does not mean that you need to know everything that there is to know about safety, but there are some things that you do need to know. First and foremost, you need to understand how safety fits into your role. Safety is not someone else's job. One of the very most valuable pieces of advice that I was given, and I got this uh, about a month after I started working with PCL from one of our very old and grizzled and old school superintendents. And his philosophy very much is, and it's absolutely correct, that there is no job that is not your job. That means safety is part of your job as well. That means that there is no job that you should be above or below. Uh, and, and every little piece works in to make you a better rounded professional. You don't need to know the acts and the regulations and the related supplements and standards and codes verbatim. I don't expect that any one of you will ever be able to rehearse the act and regulations and I still don't know it by word, but you do need to know that they exist and you need to know who to talk to when you need information on them. Who's your go-to person for it? This applies to both you and your workplace, as well as the new workplaces that you're going to design and build. You also need to know your rights and your responsibilities, both as a worker and as a professional. So as a worker in Saskatchewan, you have those three rights that we touched on at the very beginning. As a professional, that's where your ethics come in. That's where APEGS helps to guide you. That's, that's where uh, responsibilities and your rights come in on that side of things. So the next thing that will help to build and, and grow that safety culture is listening to your spidey sense. Listen to your gut. You have knowledge, you have skills, you have experience from life as you know it. And many of you have a very, very different broad uh, range of skills and experience that isn't specific to a field of engineering. You are also gaining skills and knowledge and experience on a daily basis. When you come into a new workplace with fresh eyes, don't always assume that the way that they are doing it is the absolute right way or the best way. It may simply be the way that they do it because that's the way that they have always done it. Bring out your inner child when you get into a situation where something just doesn't look, smell, feel, sound right. Ask why, ask why, ask why. We often, when we're doing investigations with incidents, we use a five why method. I encourage you to use that five why as well. Ask why five times. And finally, after that fifth why, that's typically when you get to the root and, and figure out the actual answer behind everything that happens. So if you go into a situation and it just doesn't feel right, your gut speaking to you, listen to your spidey sense, ask until you understand and it feels right. The next thing I will talk about is building safety in. So often you hear about production and you hear about quality and you hear about safety. Three standalone pillars. In reality, safety is built, should be, and is built into all of that. You can't have one without the other. I can guarantee you of all of the companies that we work with and many other companies throughout Canada, throughout the United States, if they have an extraordinary safety program, they also are a highly functioning business. They have high employee satisfaction. They do good work. They do consistent work. They make money. If there is a component that is missing, if the quality is good, oftentimes the safety is poor and your production is going to be poor. So those three components will always work in with one another. So don't make safety a standalone entity. Be mindful with your designs and your plans. What you learn in university is the technical bits and the theories of what makes a good structure or what makes a good system. What you need to learn once you leave is how to make those all workable, thoughtful end results. So a case in point, and this is from uh, very shortly after I started to work in safety, where I was at, we were doing a fairly major expansion in a uh, water treatment plant. So mechanical room, the room is 24 feet high. Uh, a one meter wide corridor through the main area of the room. The access door into that room is 30 inches wide, so just a standard door width. How would you propose a maintenance person gets over the top of the mechanical equipment 
six feet back from the edge of the corridor to change a light bulb at that 24 foot high ceiling. Anybody got any thoughts on how you get up to change that light bulb? A ladder. How many of you want to step up onto a ladder to change a light bulb that is six feet back at 24 feet in the air? A ladder is absolutely doable. And that's the yeah a hydraulic lift, except you've got to have a fairly small lift that will get in through that door. A drone, yeah, yeah. Or a whole pile of guys stacked on one another's shoulders. So there are a number of opportunities to get at that, but how about um, taking your time, being thoughtful and putting a catwalk up at the top or uh, a caged ladder to get up to it. Sometimes with valves, putting uh, a chain on that valve or putting an extension down so the valve can come down and you can use it at, at shoulder level instead of 24 feet up in the air. So take your time, be thoughtful. Oddly enough, there never seems to be enough time to do things right the first time, but we always find time to manage to do it over again when it's screwed up the first or the second or the third time. It just makes so much more bad sense to do it right the first time around. Something else down the line is always affected if you have to go back and you have to do it a second time or a third time. Make things right the first time, take the time, put the effort in, do it right the first time around, and then plan for changes to the plan. Understanding that your plan might not be perfect. Things may not always go as you envisioned them, even when you have set it out to the most minute of detail. It's important to have that backup plan in your pocket. This backup plan may simply be reshuffling a couple of people or a couple of components, or it can be calling everybody out of the swimming pool and putting water wings on everybody while you regroup. Breathe deeply, assess the situation, manage the change, Use what you know and put your next plan into place. So if you look at the Saskatchewan OHS safety regulations, safety covers many, many different scopes of work and it covers even more components of that work. There are sections that speak specifically to targeted work environments such as oil and gas, forestry, electrical, healthcare, there are even more sections that target components of every workplace that we spend time in. If you think that designing and managing is just to the code, covers your area of practice is adequate, you're missing pieces. For example, building code talks about rise and run on stairs and at what point in a break in elevation those that you need stairs. OHS regulations then take it a little bit further and they state the point where you need to have handrails for those stairs. And then we can break it down even further from there. When we talk about safety hazards and risks, we always use a hierarchy of controls. And when we look at, at identifying hazards and then putting controls in, we start with elimination or substitution. And the question there is, can we get rid of the stairs entirely? Do we need them at all? Then we move down to engineering administration. So the handrail on those stairs is an engineering. Administration is writing safe work procedures. So having everybody hold onto the guardrail when you're climbing up and down the stairs. And then finally, we land on personal protective equipment. So back to that room with the high ceilings. Like we talked before, rather than grab a ladder after all is said and done, is it possible to build a catwalk? or engineer things in a way that require maintenance that can drop down or have them at chest height instead of ceiling height. Then we can get even simpler and look directly at your immediate work area. So take a look around. Uh, I'm guessing many of you are in your homes right now. Simple question, do you have an emergency access route and is it kept clear? And then once you get into back to your classroom or into your labs or into a workplace, take a look around at the emergency exits. Are they clear or are they cluttered up with boxes and material and stacked to the ceiling with all kinds of spare parts and pieces? Are they lit in the event of a power outage? So if there is an emergency, the power goes out, can you actually find your way out? It's easy to find safety items to focus on every day. Be curious about things outside your role. It is ex ex accepted that to build a habit, 
you need a repeated behavior every day for at least 21 days. Some habits seem to form much, much easier, regardless if safety is truly a part of everything you and your organization do, then building the habit of taking stock of safety items on a daily basis should then come naturally. Get involved, active engagement. You do not learn things, how things are built, how they go together from the chair in your office or from watching TikTok videos. I guarantee you that. Take your thoughts into the field and talk to the people that are executing what you have actually imagined. Find out where your seemingly very small piece or your very large piece fits into the big picture. Find out where you fit and, and share your thoughts. Learn from each other. Talk to the builders in the field. There is a very, very fine line between the dreams and the brilliance and the ideal that go into an amazing piece of engineering. And then the bull snot and the barbecue sauce that goes into executing those visions. In the very same way that you're excited to tell people about the things that you do and the things, thoughts that you have, craftspeople are so excited to share what they know as well. They are fiercely proud of the work that they do. And when they are asked, they are exceptionally happy to share. Talk about the things that work. Open up a dialogue and ask them, hey, what is, what is the favorite part about what you do? And then ask them, what don't you ever want to have to do again? What is the thing that what is the one thing that in this overall design, in this overall structure, in this particular little piece, what is the one thing that can make it better, make it easier, make it smarter? And then with the engagement piece also comes to being a good communicator. Adjust and adapt your skills so that you can speak to the C-suite as well as the boots on the ground. You are going to be asked to make presentations. You are going to be asked to communicate with people in the field. You are going to learn very quickly that you need to have different modes of communication. So get, get involved, get, get in and, and ask questions. Ask lots and lots of questions. Be accessible, open, and honest. A good leader will never ever try to hide things. Never for a single moment think that you know it all. If there is a single day that goes by that you have not learned something new, you wasted a day. Ask questions. As I said, ask why, ask why again. If someone asks you a question, give them an honest answer. If the answer is, I don't know, that's a completely honest answer. If an I don't know makes you uncomfortable, then rephrase it by saying, I'm not sure, but I will find out. And then go find out and follow up with the person that asked you the question. The next piece is acting with integrity. Do the right thing every time. When I reflect on this myself, I ask the question, is this something that would make my grandmothers proud? Don't ever assume that you have it any worse or any better than the person next to you. You must also sometimes accept no matter how above average you may be, you are not always exceptional. Don't take corners and try to hide this. Use it as an opportunity to learn and make yourself a better rounded professional. Despite what the person standing next to you might look like or how they may speak or what their life story is, they have each got their own pieces of knowledge and wisdom and their place in this world. Every one of us brings different thoughts and perspectives to the table. We do not all need to be equals. That in truth would make our world very dull. But there is nothing wrong with equitable, an opportunity for everyone. And then the last is building a safe, strong safety culture in a workplace is actually quite similar to building a structure or a system. It's made up of bits and pieces all assembled together in just the right configuration. These pieces of responsibility, ownership, curiosity, communication, focus, change management, engagement, accessibility, integrity, not only build a strong overall culture, the balance between safety, production, and quality will also strengthen. If you dive in, it is very rare that a company, as I said earlier, that has a poor overall safety culture will have an otherwise safe, healthy workplace culture and be operationally effective and financially healthy. One will always affect the other. And strong leaders, both informal and formal, combined with engaged employees, will build and maintain pillars necessary to sustain healthy culture. And that, very quickly, 
uh, is what I have for you folks. Has anybody got any questions, any comments, any, any why? I do see one question here, Trisha, in the comments, maybe to kick things off a bit. And that is, what are items for a healthy workplace culture? And I know you went through a lot of those probably after, but if you wanted to maybe reiterate some of the more important ones or respond to that however you see fit. I know that and I'm replaced. There, there is no one piece that's going to define an active, healthy safety culture. Uh, you can go into a workplace and, and you feel it instantly. You know if it is a healthy, functioning workplace where people are happy to be there and they're engaged and they participate, or if it's one of those places where everybody sits in their offices with their doors closed and they have calendars on their wall with big red X's. And when you look at them and you ask them, what's the big red X for? They tell you how many days they have left to go until they retire. Um, there are so many, so many pieces that go into a healthy safety culture. Uh, and, and again, it's not just a standalone piece. Um, the responsibility part. So everybody has a role, everybody has accountability and, and pieces that they are, that that's part of their job. And that's what they, they are held to, to task on. Uh, ownership. The ownership comes in a few different forms where we are all part of the workplace. We all own the work that we do. We all own the final outcome. So is it, is it a, a workplace where everybody gets actively engaged and, and everybody takes a piece and nobody is pointing fingers when things go wrong? That's, that's a healthy workplace is, yep, we screwed up, we will fix it. The curiosity part, ask why, ask why and ask why. And, and in that process, that makes you a, a, a more educated, more, a better rounded individual as well. You have a preconceived notion of how things will go together. And you've had the opportunity to learn from some of the best professionals in the industry on how things are, are to be set out. But then put your own spin on it. I, as I said, every single one of you comes with different life experience. So using that life experience and then all of the, the education that you've got, how does that work into your final plan? Uh, the communication piece, I can't stress this enough. We as professionals are often intimidated and, and hesitate to go out in the field because we see all these people out there and they've got their heads down and they're busy and, and nobody wants to interrupt and say, hey, can I have a couple minutes of your time? My name is, and can you tell me what you're doing and how you're doing it? We're very hesitant to do that. And we need to get so much better at that because there's so many learning opportunities between the people that are executing it in the field and the people that are, are managing the, the higher level, the, the drawings and the, the processing, the change requests and doing all of the, the shop drawings and making sure that we've got procurement on top of things and our pieces are, are all getting there on time. And then we're having a plan to make sure we've got storage for all of those pieces. In the process, we sometimes lose the most important part of bring the people in that are actually building it, that are actually executing all of that work that we're busy planning, bring them in and ask them what their thoughts are on it. The change management piece is huge. Um, we cannot be too proud to assume that the way that we planned it the first time around is the exact perfect way. So it, it happens time and time and time again where we ourselves, we have a plan first thing at 6.30 in the morning, we talk through with our crews, this is how we're going to do it for the day. By 6.45, the crews are out in the field and the plan has changed. So we have to be able to understand what part of that plan changed. And we also need to instill with ourselves and our people that it's okay to step back and do a timeout and refocus and change the plan. Um, the engagement piece, if if people are engaged, if people are happy to come to their workplace, if people are, are involved into their, in, in what they do in their job, in, in the, 
just as simple as sit in the, the common space of an office when we can finally get back to having normal common spaces in offices and and shooting the breeze about hey what do you think about this or hey i've got this going on i'm i'm kind of you know i'm i'm looking at this and i'm looking at that and have you done this before and what are your thoughts on this being engaged and and using each other's experience is another huge piece of of a, a healthy safety culture and not hiding secrets not um not hoarding information to yourself uh, if uh, we are all teachers and and we all have the opportunity to share our knowledge and share our wisdom and if if we are keeping all of the things that we know to ourselves we're doing a disservice to everybody that comes behind us and beyond us uh, so it's really important to even if it seems very insignificant share your wisdom and then the integrity like i said do the right thing make sure engineers have uh, a, an ethics and codes of practice and that falls in with safety as well is do the right thing so that was a very long-winded answer to uh, an easy question items for a healthy workplace um, so there is a question in here that asks, are there any emergency trends in industry regarding safety practices and culture? Um, I can tell you what I'm seeing from the construction point of view is we have a lot of people who are leaving the industry, uh, construction, engineering, every piece that we deal with right now. We have a lot of individuals who are leaving the industry, whether they are close enough that they are retiring or they are um, deciding, you know what, this isn't my bag, this isn't for me, I'm going to go find something else to do. Um, with that, though, they are taking reams and reams and reams of knowledge and wisdom with them. So that goes back to my point of, of sharing. Um, we're, we're somewhat losing our teachers, we're losing our mentors, we're losing the people that have done it over and over and over again. And it's coming to people that don't necessarily have all of those years of accumulated wealth of knowledge and wisdom behind them. Um, so that's that's something that I am seeing uh, coming through with industry safety practices, safety culture is, is we're starting to lose some of the gray hair and the wisdom. And it's being reflected down in, nobody comes to a workplace and intentionally wants to do a bad job. But it's sometimes they just haven't ever been taught or, or given the education or the training on how to do a good job. The next question I see on the list here, an effective way to advance safety culture in a workplace if those who are supposed to reinforce it don't seem to want to participate in it. So oftentimes we hear that uh, leadership comes from the top down. And you will see it in a good, solid workplace where the, the leaders are, the, the formal leaders are respected. They are looked up to. Uh, they are the, the wise people that at the end of the day, they are the ones that are responsible for making the big decisions. And, and they are the ones that all of the people in the workplace have the trust in that they will make the right decisions. You're absolutely right that there are some workplaces that that's not always the case. That doesn't always happen. There is also leadership from the bottom up. So despite what comes from the top, that does not mean that that gives anybody in that workplace a pass. That does not mean that you still don't have to be responsible, have ownership in the process, be curious, communicate your thoughts, ask questions, manage change, be engaged, be accessible. There can be leadership that comes from the bottom up. I talked earlier about the formal leaders and the informal leaders and that safety culture advancement comes from the informal leaders in the case where the formal leaders aren't the ones that are making, walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, huh, next one. Training certifications related to safety specifically for engineers that's common or have to obtain in industry. Um, I would very strongly encourage 
Um, through the Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association, there is a uh, Saskatchewan Association for Manufacturers. Um, there is a Heavy Construction Safety Association. There's a number of safety associations for different industries through Saskatchewan, and they are all funded by workers' compensation. It's not necessarily a certification, but it's just an extra piece. Um, they have um, certification or construction safety officer programs or leadership programs. And I would really, really strongly encourage, grab a couple of courses out of there that, that pique your interest. Leadership for safety excellence is always a good one. There's a few that are, they're just really good, simple, grounded, um, boots to the ground kind of training courses that give you some practical information. Uh, they teach you how to do a tailgate meeting, a safety meeting. They teach you how to do an inspection. Um, they help you with questions to ask when there's an investigation that needs to be done. So some of the very basic things, but it, it also is just one more piece in your toolbox. So we also have, Rob and I have a couple of questions that were prepared by students in advance of the session. So maybe I'll pull from a couple of them um, as we keep going here. And there's one that I liked that I'll read out now. And, um, and that was, how do, can you collect yourself in a situation that you weren't prepared for? Fake it. <laughs> Go to what you know. It's, it's it go back to what you know. So, and, and I said earlier, it, it's never a bad thing to pull everybody out of the swimming pool. If you're in a, a bad place and you're up over your head, pull everybody out of the swimming pool. And you know what? We all need to take a step back. Don't be afraid to admit, I don't know, but go have, have your toolkit full of people that do know, have your, your little virtual Rolodex with people that, okay, this is my person to go to on this. This is my person to go to for this. So call your go-to people, talk through it with them. They may not even have be a subject matter expert. They just may be your go-to sounding board. Um, but don't be afraid to, to pump the brakes and say, hey, you know what? I need a minute. Let me just breathe and we'll get back. That's great advice. And it kind of builds on your earlier advice that I really liked. And that's don't be afraid to admit if you don't know. It's better to say, let me find out or I'll get back to you than to assume you do know and maybe do the wrong thing and have that come back to haunt you. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. advice. And don't be afraid to fail. Uh, we all screw things up, but mm -hmm. make sure that your initial plan has been done to the best of your knowledge and your ability. And also be prepared to take accountability for it. Take, take responsibility and take ownership of it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I made a poor choice here and I'm going to take it and we're going to fix it. Yeah, learn from it, which is a good segue to the next question here from Luke. How can someone who is new to the engineering workplace quickly get acquaint acquainted to the safety practices and regulations that apply to them? Uh, learn whether the safety person likes chocolate or coffee. Um, <laughs> and become their best friend. <laughs> so every workplace in Saskatchewan has uh, a, uh, an occupational health and safety committee, um, whether it's an actual formal committee or if it's just a representative for small workplaces that are under 10 people. Um, Rob had talked earlier about being part of the local safety committee. Um, that's exactly what that is. And if you're ever curious about that, you can actually just sit in on one of the safety committee meetings. Um, you don't necessarily have to be part of that committee. You can just sit in on one of the meetings. Again, ask lots and lots and lots of questions. Ask questions. There's a follow-up question here. Is there a global institute that writes appropriate laws for different industries in a standard way and everyone follows it? Oh no, that'd be too easy. <laughs> That would be way too easy. No. Um, so there's not one big governing body. Uh, in Canada, we have CSA and CSA standards cover uh, everything from hard hats to uh, first aid kits to um, for reach lifts and, and cranes. 
Uh, then you get into ANSI and ASNI and, and ratings on lifting devices and, and things like that. Uh, NFPA talks about building code or NFPA talks about things that also fit into building codes. So how many fire extinguishers do you need per X square meters of a building? Um, it's, there's not one institute that, that writes the laws for, and every US and Canada have different sets of standards. Uh, you get into the European Union and, and through different countries throughout Europe, um, there's all different, different levels and different standards and, and different pieces that fit in. So as a professional, it's up to you to know what piece fits where. Great. So we have time for a couple more questions if anyone wants to jump in with their thoughts or questions for Trisha, but I have a few more here. And this one is kind of interesting. Is it easy to get burned out with the amount of work that you would have to do in safety? It comes back to um, having fun with what you do and enjoying your job. Um, yeah, it's you, regardless of, of where you work, unless you have a very standard schedule of you come to work at eight o'clock on Monday morning and at 4.30 on Monday afternoon, you go home and you don't have any responsibility for anything after 4.30 until eight o'clock the next morning. Uh, as professionals, as, as people with um, jobs that you get involved in and, and jobs that you, you get passionate about and, and people that you enjoy working with and, and people that you care about. Um, you, you automatically want to go over and above. You choose to put in that little extra bit. You choose to spend the extra time. And yeah, it's, if, if you don't watch, it can very, very quickly throw things out of balance. Um, you have to be very mindful about physical health. You have to be very mindful about mental health. It can get very, very easy to get chained to a desk for eight or 10 or 12 hours out of the day. And by the time you look up, it's dark outside and you haven't eaten anything. And uh, all that you've had to drink was a couple of cups of cold coffee. So it's it's a mindful process and, and you have to keep personal checks and balances. Thanks, Tricia. There's another follow-up question here related to the governance one. If there are no regulating bodies, how do companies make sure that they're following safety practices? Or what's the oversight, I suppose, is the what's question. What's the there. oversight? So um, people like me, internally, um, and then externally. So in Saskatchewan, we have uh, the Workplace Health and Safety Division uh, of Labor Relations and, and Workplace Safety. Um, and Occupational Health and Safety Officers will come out to, to work sites and, and not just construction. They come to every site in, every workplace in Saskatchewan is registered with them. So they will make visits, they will uh, monitor information from workers' compensation. So they'll watch incidents and they will come and um, follow up and make sure that the appropriate regulations and standards are being followed. Uh, they will also offer up assistance if there is something somewhere where a, a smaller company is struggling or a bigger company just is missing the big picture on things. OHS will help and, and guide that through. Perfect. Thanks, Tricia. And I guess this would be another heads up in terms of recognizing good or bad culture, because I've heard stories at different sites where either when that truck rolls up to do their checks, everyone's kind of calm, cool and collected. Or if they're, you know, scrambling and reacting and thinking, oh, no, we got to clean up a bunch of go hide these things. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, it's not good. <laughs> oh. Here's a question from Chris. Um, does a place like PCL have engineers that are specific to safety? So my experience with safety is by and large, we have all had a life before safety. Very, very, very rarely do you ever see someone that comes straight out of high school and makes the statement, I want to be a safety person. Mm -hmm. um, we are often not 
always the most popular people. Um, so very rarely does uh, a bright eyed 18 year old want to be that person. Um, so commonly, uh, most of the time, everybody's got a life before safety. So engineers specific to safety, we try very hard to build it in. So there is a level of, of accountability for all of our people. Um, and that gets built in. So I have an engineering background and that helps me because I can read drawings. I can understand the process and, and that helps me communicate with our crews in the field and, and with our field personnel. So it's definitely an asset, but it's not, not a specific um, necessity or component. Almost like an added specialization, I guess, that people can grow into. In Absolutely. Their Interesting. Good to consider maybe early on in your journey. <laughs> Students, perhaps? <laughs> I'm currently recruiting, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not so subtle. Y'all know you can connect with Trisha after. Very well, shameless plug. <laughs> Well, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this one was posed in a number of different ways, but kind of boils down to the same thing. And I think it's a legitimate concern maybe that students are hoping to prepare themselves for. And that is, I'll read it phrased in a couple different ways. Can you get fired for going over budget if that's the only way to do the job safely? How do you manage safety when you aren't given enough time or resources? Mm -hmm. So when you're put up against a rock in a hard place, what can you do or what should they do? So this kind of helps to reinforce my point about build safety in. If, if safety is part of the production and part of the quality and part of, if safety is part of every component and every facet, there should not come a time when you're over budget because of safety. Uh, now with that said, safety costs money. Plain, simple, period. Um, and it, it's not necessarily the people that you employ as safety professionals. It's for us, it's very simple of, uh, for example, confined spaces. There is a whole pile of equipment that goes along with a confined space. So not only do we have to spend money training people to do confined space entry, we have to have retrieval equipment. We have to have air monitoring equipment. We have to have confined space entry plans. We have to have communication. If it's a, a difficult retrieval, we have to have an opportunity to communicate with emergency medic or emergency services so that they can come and take a look and make a plan. So safety even when it's integrated in as best as we possibly can it it does cost money that said as very simple of confined space again that's very clearly stated in the regulations that for confined spaces you must do this this and this so when it comes back around to okay we're over budget because we have to factor in these pieces it's a bill, it's a regulation. So if you don't do that, oh &S is gonna come around and they're gonna see it and you're gonna be fined uh, and possibly taken to court and a big black mark on your company. So I can't specifically say, can you be fired for going over budget? Uh, it's it, some workplaces that's, that may just be there out of sorts, um, but can you be disciplined or, or should you be disciplined for being mindful about your about how you are designing and how you are developing your systems and your processes? No. Great. Well, thank you. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Trisha for the great presentation, Rochelle for monitoring the mm -hmm. question period. And I can remind all students that your mandatory quiz for this session and the recording will be emailed to you shortly. And that tomorrow at 2.30, uh, there's another presentation for equity, diversity, and inclusion with Crescent Point Energy. So uh, I know you can do some reactions on uh, Zoom and such. So please join me in thanking Trish for a excellent presentation. So thanks a lot. My pleasure, folks. Thank you so much for the opportunity.